Audio recording for this meeting has begun. So, good afternoon, everybody. We are about uh, 60 participants at the moment. And uh, I think that we will just get started while maybe waiting others to arrive still a little bit in the course of these few first minutes. So first of all, welcome to this first webinar session, What is Burden and Why Should We Care? These webinars are organized in the context of the European Master in Official Statistics, which we call short EMOS. And EMOS is a joint project of 22 universities in 15 countries and data producers that provide postgraduate education in official statistics at the European level. Now, my name is Heli Lehtimäki, and I work in EMOS for Eurostat, the statistical office of the European Union in Luxembourg. This is where the session is hosted. Today, we had initially roughly 120 registered participants. So let's see how many will show up. And if all of them are with us, we cover 11 EU countries and a few outside Europe, as we have also seen in the chat today. And many of you are students or professors from the EMOS universities, our partners in the, in the national statistical institutes, or other governmental entities. Now, let me explain briefly how, the, how we run the session today. As a participant, you can watch and listen to the session. Do not switch your webcam on. However, you can chat and use signs to interact with the speakers. You find them on the left-hand uh, upper corner of your screen. Now, there you can disagree or agree what do you hear. When, you're, when, you're, when you really like something, you can applause or ask speaker to speak more, lo more loudly or, lo or slowly. Now, let's test this. Please choose to agree. agree the option if you see, let me get there, this slide with a statement. In most countries in which a national statistical agency carries out periodically recurring economic surveys, businesses and institutions are said to be becoming increasingly restive under the growing burden of response. So those who can see this slide would, would need to start saying agree with the sign and icon on your left-hand corner. And now to the chat. Please write in the chat window here, here, I can type it in, the year when the quote of the slide was published. If all this works, it means that you are ready for the webinar. Those with some problems, please follow the links and tips for the troubleshooting in the invitation email that was sent to you, or send us an email at s.emos at ec europa at dot eu and we try to help. Now finally, let me introduce to our today's lecturers. Moitsa Pavdas is assistant professor at the Faculty of Economics in the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. Moitsa is a coordinator of official statistics modules at the university's inter interdisciplinary graduate programs of statistics. She's also a member of the EMOS board. Her academic life started out with economic statistics, but her research soon shifted to data collection issues. At present, she's also attending the dissemination challenges, especially visualization in official statistics. And I'm happy to welcome our guest from Norway, Gustav Haraldsen, a senior methodological advisor at Statistics Norway and expert in, in response burden. He will say a few more words about himself later. And now to the substance of the today's session, what is burden and why should we care? Moitsa, floor is yours. Thank you, Kelly. A warm welcome to everybody, although it's a bit strange feeling that I don't see you. And uh, I'm really very pleased to give this lecture today and uh, to introduce you to the world of business surveys. As webinars are primarily in, uh, intended for Emma students, who may be new to official statistics and come from various backgrounds, this lecture will, will really start from scratch. Now, um, the publication, um, this is the text that Heli, Heli was talking about and reading, and we somehow tried to 
um, see if you found it. Um, I would like uh, now just to ask you that um, when you agree, there is a sign next to your name, but then when we finish with uh, agreeing or disagreeing, please click again on the, on the button, on the icon, so that the sign goes off. I still see a few of you with the sign agree on. Uh, okay, I think we are now all set for the next challenge. <laughs> um, the next challenge will be, can you, can you say in which year this statement was given in a scientific journal? Can you try and write the, um, the year in which this was published in the chat? And I will stop you when the first one gives, gives the, the right answer. OK. 1960, 97. Any more thoughts? So this is not for uh, testing any. Uh, any knowledge, but more preconceived ideas. And I see we have a very, very wide interval here. <laughs> OK, OK, thank you. <laughs> I think it will be enough. <laughs> I will give you the right answer. It's 1977. So I guess uh, the, the truth is somewhere in the middle uh, of what you <laughs> of what you um, suggested. And um, well, anyway, even if uh, only for the case old, I think it's, uh, it's quite interesting that this is still a very hot uh, topic nowadays. OK, now what will we cover today? First, we will start by thinking about why businesses complain about burden. Why is this an issue? Then what response burden is and why we should care about it. Then we'll have a look at the root causes of business burden and continue with how to measure this burden. Uh, and I have a uh, great pleasure to host Gustav Carlsen today uh, from Statistics uh, Norway. Gustav is already with us, but I think that we will uh, invite him to speak towards uh, the end. Now, um, I'd like to explain that if you have a question about what I'm saying, so if you need an explanation, maybe you didn't hear it well, maybe I just need to uh, clarify something, please write immediately in the chat window. I'll check this window, uh, let's say, before going to the, moving to the next topic. Um, or when we need to put answers here, so to respond as soon as possible. Um, but and if you have questions that somehow um, could be even to elaborate on an issue, or if, we, if you want to pose it to uh, Gustav, um, please wait until the break. Uh, so we will uh, then collect all these questions and try to uh, select those, the most interesting one, the most relevant one, uh, so that uh, Gustav and I will uh, discuss them. OK, and now the first topic. Why do businesses complain about official service and have been doing this for four decades? Well, nowadays, business working time seems to have become more precious than ever. Um, Businesses face global competition in really nearly every market. Um, if you think of the word global, uh, global means you find pineapples everywhere around the, the world. But if you think that um, about, let's say, our local bakery, our local bakery has to compete with a French bakery that delivers French baguette directly from France. So we are really global in all markets. Then businesses face 
pressures on achieving higher and higher productivity. Well, not only businesses. This is actually present in all economic sectors. And the pressures are there also to eliminate any so-called waste activity. I'm not sure if you know this uh, terminology. Um, it was uh, set up in 1990s uh, with Toyota production system. And uh, from there, the Lean uh, ideas uh, came that say that you should eliminate any activity that does not create value, because only this way you will focus on activities that create value. So in this, let's say, taking into account what we said now, and uh, presenting this challenging environment, do businesses really have time to complete the survey? Well, no, not really. Or at least they have been loudly questioning the need to provide data. So what's their perspective? Well, they have been getting more and more requests for data. Government wants to have data. Academia wants to have data. Commercial firms want, want to have data. And uh, businesses, on the other hand, see many alternative sources. Um, if you think of the government, as official statistics is part of the government, um, when a business submits data to one governmental body, and then uh, after some time receives a similar or the same request from another governmental body, of course uh, they say, "Oh, just talk, uh, just talk to each other," and you know the, the data, our data are already there, so you could understand that they are not happy with such. But most, maybe, maybe most upsetting for National Statistical Institute, so NSI, uh, is that businesses also seem to question survey usefulness. Now, how bad is that? Try to imagine uh, people in the business that just received another questionnaire to complete with lots of data, so especially if these are demanding things. Um, what will they think? Oh, great. I have another questionnaire to fill in. And then I will send this data to the statistical office. And they will calculate some statistics. And those statistics will be very useful to my business. And that's why I will be happy to do it. Well, I would like to, to test, again, what you think about it. Is this? A true case? What percentage of businesses do you think react this way? So that they see usefulness for their own business when filling in the questionnaire. Can you put some percentage numbers in the chat window? 10, 10, 50, 10, 15. Okay, 40, 45. Anyone give more? <laughs> okay. Okay. I think that nobody went over 50. Well, have you already started to respond, Burton? Well, um, looking at three different studies, 2006, Norway, 2008, Sweden, 2014, Slovenia, actually uh, shows that this percentage is quite low. It's between 5 and 10% in these cases. It's a bit better for when you ask about the usefulness for society. We go up to 25 to, or 35%, uh, but these results are not great. I do know of only one exception. It's from Portugal, uh, where they got 45% and 75% respectively, so much more. And I would say that at least part of the difference might come from the difference in methodology, because in this latter, uh, latter uh, study, uh, the respondents were managers. So 
and managers are typically considered to be data users in a company, not so much those that prepare reports and fill in uh, the data. Okay, so not so ideal start. What is not this response burden and why should we care? I'm quite sure that everybody understands the phrase response burden. Um, maybe even this figure here uh, can show you what, what is one interpretation of response burden. But when we think of response burden uh, in business service, we actually distinguish two concepts. One is the concept of actual response burden. We also say it's objective response burden, and it essentially refers to the time needed for a response. Now, this time can be translated into monetary terms, and then we speak about cost of responding. Now, another expression that you might um, come across is compliance cost. Uh, you might know that business surveys conducted by National Statistical Institute are uh, typically mandatory surveys, so businesses have to respond. And so it means they have to conform with government regulation by responding to uh, the survey request. So these are also called compliance costs. And the second burden concept is perceived response burden. Now, this is a feeling related to response because completing a questionnaire is a subjective experience and each person may feel uh, different about it. Now, to be more precise about this feeling uh, and how it relates to the response, perceived response burden reflects how people feel about the time spent on the task, and the cognitive or mental effort that is invested in answering questions. So actual and perceived burden, although quite connected, um, and referring to the same thing, the survey task, um, are nevertheless two different things. So it's very good that we, when we speak about burden, that we are specific which burden we have in mind. It's the same like quality, you know, when you want to have high quality, does it mean that you want to have accurate data, timely data, comparable data? Well, it's not always possible to have them all. Now, why does burden matter? Um, we can say that this is for three types of reasons political reasons, methodological, and strategic reasons. Official business surveys are part of administrative burden. Administrative burden means everything that businesses have to uh, provide because of the legislation regulation. And um, of course, the business surveys are typically mandatory. Reporting in statistical reporting is part of administrative burden. And now I have a, a new question for you. Um, how big part of administrative burden is statistical reporting? So what percentage of administrative burden falls on statistical reporting? Let's see. Is it 10, 15, 5, 20? Okay, 0.7. Well, I think that 0.7 came from an NSI. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. Um, actually, statistical reporting is a very, very tiny part of administrative burden. And uh, I, I think that what happened, can you hear me? Yes, 
do you see my slide? No, no slide. Kelly, do you know? Oh, let, me, let me try and see if I can rescue this again. This was a wrong document. I received, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, my webcam. But your webcam is gone and the slides are gone. So let's try and see if we can take a new. Okay. Can you upload your? Back. Can you upload your slides again or share? If I put this here, share your screen again. Yeah, just a second. To do it on the right computer. Um. Can you just mute me for a minute because I have to check with my IT support. Oh, okay. I hope our participants are patient because this is the uh, things that can happen for the first time, huh? Can you say in the chat room if you're seeing some slides being flipped through? Yes, okay, so these are our backup files uh, from Moitza. So now we need to get Moitza back. So, Moitza, are you back? We, we can see you, and I think you can also hear and talk. Just a second. My computer froze. Moitz, I put the PDF um, on the shared space, if, if that helps. Not so much. Not so much.
We have not yet lost one single participant, so everybody is still anxiously waiting. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. Hmm. Okay. Okay. We're back. We are back on the road and driving. Okay. Cool. Okay, excellent. Cool. Thank so you. Show must go on, huh? Yeah, the show must go on. I'm sorry for this. Uh, I don't know what happened. Um, Bye. Thank you. Okay. Um, sorted? Okay, let's continue. I think that your, um, you thought the statistical office is really, uh, how to say, <laughs> to use the right word, sending questionnaires every day, but um, it, it's not the truth. Actually, if you think of taxes, taxes is something that you do every day in the business. But uh, statistical reporting, you do it just from time to time. And um, actually, when you calculate it, it's a very, very tiny part of administrative burden. As I said, um, the largest number that I saw was 2%, more usually less than 1%. Uh, but um, still, it is considered unproductive engagement uh, of resources, and not only are benefits ignored, one of the EU bodies labels statistical reporting as irritation burden, so not really nice. So that's why it's important to monitor the total actual response burden at the national level to show that this is really tiny thing. I dare say, uh, however, that methodological reasons are even more relevant for official statistics production um, and reputation also than political ones. Because um, too much burden may lead to potentially problematic survey behavior, non-response, late response, or uh, inaccurate response. So we end up with errors, measurement errors, uh, non-response errors, and uh, that means lower data quality, or, as official statistics uh, tries very hard to keep uh, the quality uh, high, uh, it means that you face uh, higher cost to achieve uh, that quality. For instance, you have to chase respondents to get data. Um, you have to ask them for explanations for inconsistency in the data. Uh, or data are published late and so on. So that's why it's important that um, you m monitor actual and perceived response burden at the survey level. And last but not least are strategic reasons for monitoring response burden at the organizational level for uh, every business that uh, is in your uh, sampling frame, uh, because business community is a, a key stakeholder. Practically, the data they provide are the basis for key economic Now, um, I have another question for you. And uh, I will now show you a document that is very important for official statistics. And please, and this will be a bit for the people from NSI, but I'm quite sure that students by the end of the semester will also recognize this document immediately. So what is this document? A bit changed. Do I see? Yes, very, very good. EUCOP or the European Statistics Code of Practice. Yes, very good. 
So this is the document that um, that has 15 principles about how official statistics in the European Union, Europe largely, uh, should uh, work. And one of these 15 principles is about the burden, more specifically about non-excessive burden for the respondent. And it says, the reporting burden is proportionate to the needs of the users and is not excessive for respondents. So this means, if you need more data, you can ask more, as long as the respondents don't think it's too much, okay? And the statistical authorities monitor the response burden and set targets for its reduction over time, which implies that we have to measure response burden if we want to follow this principle. Now, another important document is uh, the UN Fundamental principle, Principles of Official Statistics. Um, there you have principle five that is about data sources. Well, <clears throat> the principle five mentions statistical service and administrative records as data sources. And when choosing the source, Statistical agencies should <coughs> be careful about quality, timeliness, cost, and the burden on respondents. So we have um, we have uh, burden really in this key document. So we should pay attention to it. And now, what are root causes? of business burden and uh, complaints. Well, um, to understand the root causes, it's good that you witness, or meaning that you see in practice how a business respondent uh, completes the questionnaire, especially if it's a more demanding one. Now, um, we don't have an example here. Uh, when I have some example, you can usually not get permission to air it. But we can get the basic idea also by observing our own participation in such. Now, I have two questions for you, and I will give you a minute to read and answer these two questions for yourself. You don't have to share um, answers, just, but I want you to try and write down the answers, okay? So you have to make a decision what the answer is. And so here is your minute. Just, just try for yourself. Okay. Okay, let's stop here. And I like also those few answer that you put, you revealed in the chat. Do you ever, so think for a moment how you went about answering this question. Do you ever count stairs when you walk? Well, I will speak for myself now. I often count stairs. I, know, I don't know if it, this is anything about data, being data uh, minded or not, but uh, I do. I developed that habit as a child, and I now have kids and continue doing that. That's why for me this question was very, very easy. Answer it really off the top of my head. And I can say I provided a true, accurate answer without thinking very much. No burden. The second question, how many messages did you receive yesterday? Well, that for me is a totally different uh, question. 
But first of all, what messages? Do you mean like text messages? Do you mean email? And when thinking about email, spam included or not? Uh, what about Facebook or wherever? Um, what about posts? Do you consider that a message as well? And what? So it's very fuzzy. And also back yesterday, well, I went to bed quite late. Uh, so I should not count messages received after midnight time. So to give, yeah, to give uh, approximate, approximately good answer, I have to invest quite some time and mental effort to think of all the relevant accounts and probably check the phone, the email, and then really count them to get an answer. And some of you answered like 30, 50, 100. Well, then it's obvious that you, you are guessing uh, that the and, and that the answer contains at least some measurement error. Now, as this one, you would see that um, there might be some measurement error in it. Okay, but this one is only for fun. I'll now show you a real example. Um, an owner of a supermarket, so a grocery shop, that completed uh, the questionnaire of the structural business survey conducted by Statistics Netherlands, and it was Deirdre Gieser that hopefully will be with us the next time uh, that uh, offered this case. So if we look at this example, obviously this respondent struggled with the questionnaire. Maybe as you would struggle with the message question if I wanted you to get specific numbers. Um, what did this response do that shows us it's not an easy thing? Well, first of all, you see, you know, he crossed out items that are irrelevant or unavailable to him, and he was let's say, substituting some official descriptions with some familiar words, and he was reshuffling answers. So all these indicate it was not a straightforward job. And by looking at this example, we can also make a comparison with um, questions that we receive as individuals when we uh, answers uh, participating surveys uh, ourselves. Can you find a question mark? I don't think so. There is no, there are very rarely question marks uh, in survey, uh, in business surveys, and actually we are talking about a question here. Uh, instead of questions, we usually have items or item labels. And, okay, maybe we are used to that. Then respondents have to decide which items are applicable and which are not applicable. This does not happen in surveys, surveys of individuals. They always guide you through uh, the questionnaire. And item labels often use technical terms, and although you don't see it here, um, there are also um, there may be detailed instructions uh, included. And the collected data are mainly quantitative, rarely categorical, and <clears throat> you cannot come up with the answer by heart. You have to look up records uh, to provide an answer. And as this takes time, business surveys are usually uh, self admitted so this thing, this question seems much more like our message uh, messages question. Uh, so in fact, quite burdensome. Now, if we think of how we come up with an answer, we see that we have to to go through different 
uh, basis. And I have here a response model. And when we think about a person, the person, either us or the owner of the supermarket, um, has to go through um, several processes to come up with an answer. Well, these um, cognitive processes, mental processes, are known in psychology and were first applied to uh, survey context in 1984 by Roger Turango. And uh, this actually means we, that we first try to understand the question or an item, then we retrieve data from information from memory and from records. And then when, when we get all these data, we try to somehow make sense of them and formulate an answer. So it's not a one-way street. It's lots of back and forth and back and forth. Um, <clears throat> and this gets complicated if there are more people involved, not only one. And this may happen in a, in a business setting quite easily. Uh, and when several people are involved, then, of course, this organizational level also becomes important. But we will, will not go that deep today. Uh, one more thing is that how exactly these processes are uh, carried out depends also on the fact that you uh, get the survey. Uh, if you get the survey for the first time, or if you get it for the second, third, so time when you already mm, familiar with the question. So business surveys are uh, often really recurring in a they get repeated every month, every quarter. And now, <clears throat> as I said, having several people in the response process um, makes things a bit more burdensome. And I have now an example from Slovenia. It was a quarterly survey on trade. Uh, and we have an example of a large company. And here you see six rectangles, and they represent six people. You have a black line that separates the business on the left and the statistical organization on the right. And these dotted lines separate different um, departments within the business. Now, when the survey questionnaire arrives at the company, the first thing is that the person in the middle, the response coordinator, telephones statistical organization to arrange a uh, deadline postponement because she knew that their information system will not have the data re uh, ready when the deadline comes. Then she asked uh, a colleague in personnel department for employment data uh, by phone. Afterwards, she copied the questionnaire and took it, took that copy to accounting department so that these two colleagues in the accounting department could share it. And she got, so the person providing accounting data also collected tax data from the other colleague and sent all the data to the response coordinator. Now, the response coordinator herself added some uh, data on the sales breakdown. And when the, all the data were in the questionnaire, she took the questionnaire to uh, her boss to get um, the signature. Uh, she said that this is just formality, but still she involved one more person. So in this complex case, we have three people, three respondents, actually. So one respond, response coordinator and three people that interacted with the questionnaire, plus one person, we may call it data provider, that just provided data without having uh, the questionnaire. So 
not all response processes are so complex and burdensome, but many do involve more than one person, and um, that, of course, takes, takes time and uh, requires effort. Now, although response burden happens as part of business response, it actually all starts with survey, uh, well, with data needs, needs and survey conception. Uh, we'll have a look at <coughs> this holistic perspective on response burden in uh, the next seminar. Okay, I see here, so before moving on to the next interruption, do most of you hear me? and see the slides? Maybe we can do the voting. Can vote. Agree? See? Okay, I see. Green agree. Okay, perfect. So I hope that uh, whoever has problems also solves them quickly. Okay, and now how to measure the response, the response burden. How to make this concept uh, operational. Well, first of all, we have to decide whose tasks in the response process will we take into account. In principle, we should take uh, the tasks of everybody, but then it's difficult or demanding to collect data. Now, <clears throat> of course, the most important person here is the respondent, but um, respondent tasks may, um, may, I don't know, represent just a certain portion of all time invested in survey completion. Here I have some <coughs> results for Slovenian Intrastat. Um, respondents' uh, tasks took about, on average, 75% in larger companies and 90% of time in smaller companies. So if you decided to neglect all others, then you would uh, underestimate response burden considerably. Then the second question is, which task of the response uh, process will we take into account? Okay, completing the questionnaire, yes. But what about activities beyond questionnaire's completion? Especially gathering and preparing data, calculations, this all might be much lengthier uh, than entering uh, the answers. Then there are initial one-off activities like setting up records um, exclusively for survey uh, purposes. Um, this is often uh, neglected. Uh, and OK, it might be less important if, um, if the business is in the sample then for a very long time, but still. And then there is um, non-response and non-response. Uh, activities, and this is again very important because <coughs> non-response might be, uh, let's say, I, maybe I should not say uh, uh, say that non-response is high in official statistics, but still it might not be negligible. So the, we should decide whether to count non-responding units as if they responded or not. And if they didn't respond, whether to consider at least those activities that the businesses had to do um, to communicate or to, to make a decision about rejecting this survey request, survey participation. Well, usually this is, again, not uh, included, but at, at the aggregate level, this might add up as well. And one more thing is, what about the benefits of response? We 
mostly talked about the burden, so what is difficult, but actually there, there are survey results, statistics coming out of this uh, report. And <clears throat> that do somehow have the role of lowering uh, the burden. So should we make this um, burden net of benefits or leave them gross? And um, a Dutch statistician at De La Borse proposed some answers already back in 1997. And he said that in most cases, it's preferable to measure objective gross burden. Objective means that it's preferable to measure actual response burden without taking account of any benefit. Why? Because it's easier. He was a very pragmatic person. And thinking further, that it's preferable to measure maximum risk and accepted burden, which means all tasks related to the questionnaire survey of all those that responded, so not that were requested to respond, but only those that accepted that. And why this choice? Because it's more realistic. Now, we said that statistical reporting is part of administrative burden. And administrative burdens are commonly measured by the standard cost model. Now, the standard cost model focuses on the actual response burden expressed monetary terms. Concerning the inclusion of tasks, this model specifies 16 activities, like information retrieval, assessment, calculation, checking, and so on. Um, it doesn't include one off activities, so this setting up records and so on, and it recommends full compliance. Now, uh, that means full compliance means imposed burden, so counting as if all units responded. And this might be quite okay for taxes, but maybe not so much okay for statistics. And why do MSIs choose not to strictly follow uh, this model, not only about the full compliance, that's um, kind of problematic. It's also that the estimation of the actual response burden is based on a small number of interviews with businesses. And of these interviews offer a deeper insight in the burden, but at the same time, they are very expensive. And if we look at a few examples, how you can come up with a meaning, come up with an average say, time spent on, on the, the survey, you, so the whole um, task is divided into activities, and each activity is measured, and then based on, let's say, five interviews or any other small number of interviews, you would get a typical value. Now, maybe the case is A, B, and D um, are such that we could accept this uh, typical values as an average that we will use in the estimation of, uh, of the whole population. But <clears throat> most commonly in business surveys, we have more something like this case here, when you go from two minutes or five minutes up to 50 minutes, or even the spread could be even wider. And what is then the um, the result, well, that you need more interviews. 
value. So, of course, interviews are very expensive and uh, really, in the end, not an acceptable option for most business surveys. And there are many other decisions that have to be made about the collection of uh, burden data. First of all, who will be the source of data on burden? Will we ask directly survey participants who are the best source for uh, burden data and actually they are the only source for data on perceived burden because for, set, for perceptions you have to uh, answer for yourself, you cannot answer for other people. Or <clears throat> will you take experts that have the advantage of putting no additional burden on the uh, businesses. Then you have to decide for the timing and mode of data collection. Will you ask about the burden as part of the survey, which is the best option because of forgetting, but it's quite unacceptable in short surveys. So in the, that, at least in that case, you have to ask separately after the survey because you cannot have more burden questions than survey questions. And then you have to decide about the coverage. And this is, of course, also related a little bit to um, the mode. Let's say if you ask as part of the survey, then maybe you can use all survey units or ask just a representative sub subsample. Um, of course, you can also decide for a qualitative subsample and this is the case where you have, where you follow the standard cost model. And also you have to decide about the frequency, so how often will you collect the data, and um, essentially here you have to answer the question, how much is burden expected to change and in what aspect? Can we model or estimate um, uh, the change, or do we really go into new data collection to get a reliable figure out? And here is the formula for actual response burden calculation that is very simple, doesn't really require any further explanation. Um, <clears throat> as we saw, the real challenge is to make all decisions up to this. So when we speak about the number of respondents, okay, you have to de decide who will count as respondent, uh, what tasks are included, let's say, when you measure time, um, and whether, let's say, when it comes to cost, whether, uh, so which, which cost will you take, how, how much does an hour of a business respondent uh, count and uh, will you uplift the figure for overhead, which is up to 30 percent? Um, what I should say is that um, response burden is typically measured for each survey, and then all these data are added up to come the, the sum with the total. Now, <clears throat> to give you an idea where NSI, so National Statistical Institute, were back in 2010, I used some results from the Blue ETS um, project. Uh, a Blue ETS survey was conducted among NSI by a team that was led by Deirdre Giesen from Statistics Netherlands that I already mentioned. Uh, the survey was completed in 2011, and we got response from 41 uh, NSIs from 39 countries, and what discovered is mainly Europe, but also Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the US from US. Um, the survey covers the, both burden measurement and reduction practices, and today we'll only look at the results for burden. Now, <clears throat> which concept is measured or was measured 
back in 2010 in, in uh, the survey NSI. So mostly actual response burden and let's say a smaller part uh, also measured perceived burden. Um, then when it comes to the indicator as the main indicator of actual response burden, let's say half of these uh, NSI uh, used only time indicator, while the other half translated this into money and used cost as uh, the main. Uh, now, very important for comparison purposes is how <coughs> NSI treat non-responding units. And we have here that, let's say, for 13 NSI, that total uh, burden included um, all units, regardless uh, if they responded or not. And in 11, only accepted burden was uh, Considered. Now we also have um, had six NSIs that did, that had both, um, and that is good news when you uh, know, like for Ireland, that they calculate two different indicators of total burden. But it's not that good to hear that, let's say, within um, within an NSI. Some surveys use uh, imposed burden and other surveys use accepted burden. Then when it comes to the source of data, um, as you can see, these two numbers do not add up um, because actually each NSI usually uses more than one source of data. So you, you could ask survey participants, but you could also get um, expert. And uh, as to the coverage, the preferred option was to ask all survey, survey units. But there are also NSIs that follow the standard cost model, and those are probably um, 13 NSIs that can rely on qualitative. So <clears throat> another important inconsistency is the inclusion of tasks in the actual response burden. And we have here the filling in the questionnaire as if the minimum um, of tasks included or explicitly included by 31 and aside. Then we have three tasks groups of tasks beyond questionnaire completion, so prepar uh, preparatory uh, phase, reading questions and instructions, and administrative tasks like coordination. And you see that we are kind of losing consistency when we go down this list. Record formation as this initial um, one-off activities were, let's say, rarely considered. And even more uh, interesting is that recontacts with businesses were considered in very few cases, especially if you think that recontacts, data on recontacts, something that NSI already have, you don't have to burden the businesses that that data. And even if recontacts is not a big deal for you look at a single company, when you add up three contacts, you, you, you get a certain number. So we can um, conclude that there are very different approaches with questionable comparability. But as I said, this was back in 2010. Maybe, maybe today we have another world. Now, <clears throat> We said that survey participants are the best source of data on response burden, but how exactly to pose uh, questions? I'll now go just quickly through some examples, but I invite you to check 
the complete set of questions in the original sources that is stated uh, here below. So when thinking about questions, actual response burden, how you will ask, um, the main idea is to support the respondent uh, to, uh, in this answering uh, process because it helps remember all tasks and all respondents involved. So it's good to ask separately about collecting relevant information and completing the question. And it can get a bit um, complicated. More than one respondent is included. And of course, it's important to ask did other people help, how many, and then to try to ask. So uh, then if you want to, to really uh, help and uh, respond and get a good uh, answer, accurate answer, then it takes several questions. But of course, one question is sometimes also sufficient to get at least an idea. Okay, uh, perceived response burden, two main questions are about the time burden. So was it quick or time consuming to collect information, complete the questionnaire? And the second question is about uh, cognitive burden. So was it easy or burdensome filling the questionnaire? And you can see this five point scale. And we are gone. I had a few more slides. Yes. But uh, no, I, I, I think Moitza indeed that we don't see again something. But um, yes. Yeah. Can you just please uh, put the, the PDF? Yeah. I will try. Let's try that. Yes. So. So then I suppose we need to go to. Can you manipulate the slides yourself? Uh, and start your webcam if you want, but if not, at least we can hear you and the slides are on as well. Yes. Um, it's just that I want to show you. This. Do you do you manipulate? Do you can you move the slides? Yes. Yes. I I just want to show this two great sources for um, further reading. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I hope that, well, I see that um, And our participants are saying that uh, they can hear us, they can see us. It's just your, web, your webcam, we don't see you, but we see the slides and we can hear you. Okay, um, I will just wrap up uh, this part. Uh, I just wanted to show you that you, uh, there are two great uh, publications uh, if you want to know more about burden management. And this is the handbook uh, from, nine, uh, from 2007 that was edited by Trina Dale and Gustav Haraldson. And then there is a chapter in the Wiley book, Designing and Conducting Business Surveys, um, written by Gustav uh, and colleagues. And um, you can see that Gustav Haraldson co-authored both of these sources, and that's also the reason that he'll join us today. And of course, because he's a nice and wise person. And um, let's now take a five-minute break. And if you have questions that you would like uh, Gustav and I discuss, uh, please uh, write them in the chat window. So we start now with a five minute break. I'm waiting for the questions and then we'll resume hopefully with all uh, technology in place.
Uh, hello? Hello, good stuff. Okay, you hear me? Yes. Um, I, but everybody <laughs> hears us. Oh, everybody hears us. Everybody hears us at the moment. Gustav, do you, do you have a webcam? Do you want to switch it on? Uh, I can do that. View start sharing. There we go. Good to see you, Gustav. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'm here. Um, but uh, wasn't the idea that we should be able to? Oh yeah, everybody can hear us now. Okay. Everybody can hear us now. Do you see the the chat room? If there are any questions for you. And people are saying that they see us at the moment. Yeah. And we you. have the slides. That they, these are the PDF version of um, yeah. of Moisa's yeah. slides. So we have yeah. some some hiccup at her end at some point. Yeah. Uh, that's even better because then I can slide through them myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, but I only see myself. I don't see you on the. I can the video. Let's see. Hello. Let's um, internet, Adela. The, the video says only yeah. one. So that's me. Yeah, that's you. That's me. But let's say yeah. that uh, on the, I, I'm the ghost behind, so the talking is, is done between you and Moisa. So I just try to troubleshoot in case there is something wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think I will vanish again, but I have proven that I'm here. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How it seems only to be when Moncha, where are you? <laughs> lost in confusion. Yeah, lost. <laughs> lost in confusion. <laughs> um, yeah, my question. Um, yeah, I'll, I have uh, to it again um, because uh, we had obviously problems with the network and. Uh, <laughs> But Moisa, you can also see the questions, even if we don't see you, uh, I suppose. Not yet. Not okay. Yet. You don't see them? Able. Okay. I, I see two able. questions here. Uh, I think I will uh, maximize one. Do you, you still see it? No, but we see all the questions. Uh, I don't know about participants, oh, yeah. but I don't see you anymore. Okay. Hmm. We'll like that. I see because there is a. I think the the, um, the chat area is is rather small, but it seems like it's either rather small or it's filling the whole screen. So there, there doesn't seem to be something in between. Does that help? Oh, I, 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 I change the proportion. That helps a lot. Yeah. Okay. That helps a lot. Yeah. network. Okay. And um Ah, oh, you're I back. You. Well, welcome, welcome back, my son. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's nice. Okay. I see we have two questions here, Moisa. But everybody uh, hears us now? All, all the participants also hear us? Okay, I think the five minutes have gone oh, over. So I think, yeah. that, Moisa, you were left at the further reading point, so I, I place you here, but then I suppose you can go from there where you want. <laughs> yeah, I wanted also to show this nice uh, source of information to general officials. Uh, put, it, put it a little bit closer to the webcam because I'm not sure that everybody saw it properly. Yeah. Journal of Official Statistics, and no one can see. Okay. Yeah. But you will get the whole uh, list of references at the end of uh, at the end of the slide, so no worries even if you didn't see it well. Okay. okay. I think good stuff. We can just start with. Um, Questions that we uh, have here. Is there any research on the best method to get across to the public and businesses? 
that the response burden for official statistics is significantly lower than is typically perceived. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know if there is any research on it, really. Uh, what it is, what it, what uh, it is research about is different uh, efforts to try to communicate to the businesses that statistics is uh, important. But um, and, and most of them, or I think all of them, doesn't don't show any significant effect really on the on the on the perceived burden or on people's attitude towards the service. It's very hard to convince uh, business people that um, um, it's well worth spending uh, that time on on filling in questionnaires. But there has been done some efforts to try to do that. Uh, but to the, to the question is is more than, um, um, I mean um, to find a best method to get across to the public that that, uh, that uh, the, the the burden is low. Well, I could perhaps add one comment, and that is. Just to talk about response burden. Response burden is is a loaded term. Just to to try to convince people that uh, the response burden is not so high. Well, if you use the term response burden, you already indicate that it is a kind of burden. So I prefer rather to use the, the term user experience and talk about uh, different kind of user experiences. That's a little bit beside the point. Yeah, actually, perceptions are a difficult topic, not only for response burden, also. There is, uh, there is another point here also, and that is that very often you will find that those people that you get in contact with, which are the respondents, they will uh, typically Sometimes they will not consider the response burden to be very high uh, because uh, responding uh, on questionnaires is part of the job. It's the managers that are more concerned about response burden because it's the managers that are concerned about money. And as uh, Moja was saying, uh, measuring uh, actual what we call actual response burden is in fact a way of measuring what it costs, the cost of the of the business. Okay, uh, another question asks, I assume the statistics provided are about paper surveys. Do we have any data if having an online survey is less burdensome or if it's perceived as less burdensome? So if, it, if there is any difference when you go to the web, um, what happens to the burden? Uh, first of all, the, the first thing I could say about this is that um, um, your assumption is not completely correct <laughs> because many of, many of those measurements are done uh, from from uh, web surveys or electronic surveys, uh, self-administrative um, web surveys. So the, the, um, the, the, the proportion of uh, surveys that are run uh, without paper and on web is quite high for business surveys compared to social surveys. And for instance, in my country, we don't we don't provide paper uh, survey questionnaires anymore. Uh, all our business questionnaires are uh, on the, on a website. But there and there has been. I mean, very often you will find that the argument for changing from paper questionnaires to a web question is if that the response burden will go down. But there are very few um, uh, researches, uh, results that sort of back up that notion. And uh, also very little effort is done to back up that notion. But there are few, there are a few examples. I, one I remember just now is one from, from the Netherlands. And they, 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 looked into that and they found that there was a slight 
uh, reduction in the time that it took to complete the questionnaires when it was changed to, to, to that questionnaires. But it's not very much. Um, and it's very hard to study also. And One, it's a question yeah. also. It's a yeah, question well, also how much in the introduction of uh, these online surveys um, was an excitement about technology, not so much the change in uh, <laughs> the task itself. Yes, and. Uh, and as I said, I mean, it's, it's also difficult to compare very often because uh, very often when one changes from paper to, to web questionnaires, uh, one makes a lot of changes at the same time. Uh, one might even include more questions, which make the uh, uh, comparisons quite difficult. Okay. Um, there, was, there is one question about the coordination of surveys as a way to control the burden. I would say that I will leave this question for the next time, but of course, yes, coordination uh, is definitely one way to control uh, the burden, but we will look into this as part of the uh, next session. That's why I would uh, rather ask Gustav, um, we had uh, these results from 2010, and NSIs measured actual response burden quite differently, and uh, this really compromised comparison. Are we anywhere near, nearer to the common framework for measuring response burden? Is the has the situation improved? What is your impression or your opinion about that? Well, I should say perhaps that I don't know. Uh, which in fact means that I don't think um, talking about sort of coordinating the way you want to measure uh, response burden is not very high at the agenda for the time being. So I, I would I would guess that nothing much really happens when it comes to to comparisons between between. Uh, But of course, some countries have now collected data for uh, for a while, for 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 a certain period of time, so they can see how things change over time. Um, one may also ask, um, what do we really want to? Why do we really want to compare? What do we really want to, to compare the? the actual level of the response burden, or do we need to compare uh, how response burden is changing? Uh, I think perhaps it, it could be more interesting to see, to, to compare countries um, concerning which countries have, have been able to reduce response burden, rather than being very much, uh, focused very much on the actual level of, of response mm -hmm. burden. Okay. Um, now we didn't really have time to go uh, through these questions on uh, burden, but are you, let's say, coming from statistics, Norway that has been measuring burden for a while, are you satisfied with the, these concrete questions on burden, or do you see some open issues? Well, I think I should comment upon um, two things, then, both actual burden and, and perceived burden. When it comes to the actual response burden, the, 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 the measurement problem with, with um, estimating, the, the main uh, problem with estimating the actual response burden, I think, is that, well, as also as you showed in your presentation, that um, uh, there might be different sources where you have to collect the data. There might be different persons, in, a lot of persons involved in in collecting the data needed to to complete the questionnaire. And it's very hard on you to uh, post some very accurate questions about how much time did it took 
for, let's say, two or three or four people to help you in order to provide the, the necessary data. So in, in that sense, I think that the time estimates that we have for actual response burden is not very exact. But uh, if that is a, again, if that is a big problem, I don't know. Um, uh, I mean, if you if you want to calculate the actual cost down to the to the to the nearest euro, it's it's a problem. But is it really that? It's not really that uh, what you want. Um, so when it then when it comes to to perceived response burdens, which is my main interest, I think perceived in, uh, response burden is. Uh, important because it tells something about the process that lead to quality or the absence of quality or quality problems. So it, it is a kind of process data. And um, what I think um, uh, we should do more is to study the relationship between res uh, perceived response burden and quality indicators. Because there are some research that that suggests that um, both um, a high perceived response burden and also a very low perceived response burden might lead to quality um, uh, problems. You can you can think that if the if if the respondent perceived the, the questionnaire and, and the task to be very difficult, uh, he will produce errors. Or if he thinks this is much easier than what it really is it might also produce uh, errors. And to find that balance is, is a sort of challenging uh, research question. Um, and how much does actual response burden help you in estimating perceived response burden? The time it takes um, to fill in the questionnaire is one source of uh, that affect the, the the perceived burden, and there is a clear correlation between those two. But to me, uh, the actual response burden, the time it takes fill in the questionnaire, is more uh, an economic measurement and a measurement how much it costs the, the um, for the businesses to complete the the, the survey, and it is a an important post fact, uh, cost factor because uh, if you think about cost efficiency, a cost efficient data collection as the relationship between quality and cost, you should in, you should actually you should uh, definitely also include the cost it it takes for the businesses and and one tendency you see now is that. Uh, when uh, uh, web questionnaires, electronic questionnaires have been uh, implemented, uh, uh, um, activities that was um, previously done in-house, like editing, is sort of outsourced into the web questionnaire. And if you don't, if you don't uh, measure, uh, look at the uh, the cost, then you um, um, you may do that. Uh, error that you think that the cost has gone down, but in fact you have you have exported a cost rather. Okay, we have two more questions here. Let's try to see. Is there any idea about the relation of the complexity of the questionnaire itself and the perception of response burden? I mean, are questionnaires as clear and simple as they could should be? Are there efforts being made in implementing harmonization in the terminology? OK, these are two big questions. <laughs> no, it's, you can squeeze it down to one minute. <laughs> I will, squeezing it down to one minute, I will say that questionnaires are never, are never perfect. But the main problem with the business questionnaire is that uh, there might be a mismatch in what we ask for and what kind of information that is readily available to the to the businesses, and um, so we should try to 
to um, change our freshness and more so they are so they sort of are harmonized more to the terminology and not only the terminology but also the records that are available in 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 the businesses themselves but it's difficult one difficulty is that that uh, the business world is very heterogeneous and they they use different systems they uh, accountancy systems and and so on so that so what is readily uh, available might differ very much from, from different kinds of uh, businesses and businesses of different size. Okay, and uh, the last question that we will take, does perceived burden tend to change during the completion of a questionnaire? Believing it is harder while in the middle of doing it versus reporting on overall perception after completion? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, it's hard whilst in the middle of doing it uh, while reporting on oral. Well, usually the the questions are asked at the end of the questionnaire, and we we really don't know much about this. Uh, there might be some paragraphs that can sort of uh, shed light over of the question you ask. But what we know is that. Um, what, and what we have some research on is uh, how uh, response burden is perceived the first time uh, a questionnaire is presented and then how it's perceived the next time or when, when the same server has been repeated uh, some, sometimes. Yeah, well actually um, that case where I showed those six people involved in the response process with the coordinator and so on, that lady said that for her, the first questionnaire completion was like preparing a PhD. So that was uh, maybe <laughs> a, a, a matter of speech, but <laughs> it showed that it was very challenging the first time. And then once she mastered it, it was not a problem anymore. OK, I think we have to close now. Um, thank you so much, Gustav, that you uh, found the time to join us and my and thank you everybody for um, uh, cooperation here and for your patience and understanding now the word goes to Heli thank you okay thank you thank you also from my side uh, first of all for the uh, inspiring speakers and for the participants who joined us from uh, many many places I would actually do the last interactive exercise and ask our participants who like this webinar to applaud from the icon selection that we had where you could agree and disagree. And here you can see the applauds coming in for all of us. Put it somewhere here that we can still see the faces. So I see lots of applauds coming in. So those who enjoyed it um, and would like to join us still next week for, uh, in next two weeks for the next uh, session on um, response burden for about how to reduce and manage the burden. So the next session is taking place on 1st of March in the same hour, Central European time, 16.30 to 18 hours. Please register on the EMOS website like you did to this one and you will get the invitation a few days before and uh, we can see you again in two weeks time. Now, those of you um, who want to have the slides, I think we now will lose the webcams, but I will put you through into this place where on the bottom you will see the, instead of the chat window, you will see the file section. And I will leave this space open for another, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. So those who want to download uh, the, um, the uh, presentation that Moisa just made uh, can do it from here. So I would simply say thank you at this point and uh, see you in hopefully and hear you hopefully in two weeks' time. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 <laughs>